we're correcting a narrative with this project. And it's been an incorrect narrative, and it's led to bad policy. <laughs> This map is a comprehensive and up-to-date chronicle of activities from dozens of Shia militias across the Middle East and really focuses on what impact these forces are having and will have on American foreign policy and the region. Uh, I'm Philip Smythe. I'm a SORA fellow at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. We're currently fighting uh, a protracted war against the Islamic State and a lot of other uh, radical Islamist groups. Well, just because we're doing that, it doesn't mean that the territory that we may have forces on aren't facing other threats from, say, Shia Islamist groups. And so it's very, very important to really acknowledge that and also realize that they bring a lot to the table. Well, there was this easy narrative of arguing, okay, it's the forces of Bashar al-Assad which are pushing back uh, rebel forces or the Islamic State in Syria. Or in Iraq, it was quite easy to say that it's just the Iraqi government that's pushing back the forces of the Islamic State without acknowledging the contributions of tens of thousands of Shia militiamen. However, there is a, a, a bit of complexity that's far more important that we've overlooked. And that overlooked piece is the growth and the rise of Iranian power in the region. Uh, Iran acquired a lot of its recruits from Iraq, from Syria. They've actually built a network within Syria, from Lebanon with Lebanese Hezbollah. Uh, they've also recruited Afghan refugees, both within Iran and outside of Iran, and even Pakistani Shia. And how they use these different Shia militia groups, sometimes they have government recognition. Sometimes they have tens of thousands of men at the front and the acknowledgement isn't really there, but meanwhile, Iran is reaping all the benefits. When focusing on Shia militias, it's not just important to look at different movements or the different deployments that they've engaged in, but why they're doing it, and also where a lot of these fighters have come from. So I actually mapped out where different Shia neighborhoods were in Lebanon, in Syria, in Iraq. And I also tried to throw in the ethnic component, too, because not all Shia are just Arabs. In fact, groups that are often considered Shia in much of academic media don't necessarily even consider themselves as Shia as, say, the Twelver Shia, which are the dominant sect within Shiism. Some groups, like the Ismailis, tend to not really have Shia militias that are deploying elsewhere. But where exactly do they live? What sites are important to them? How are these sites used to craft a narrative to make men go to war and fight for them? Understanding different ethno-religious groups and why they go to fight and also where they live is rather important when analyzing their moves. If we look at the Shabak Shia, which live in northern Iraq near Mosul, many of these groups were pushed out by the Islamic State in their advance back in 2014. However, the groups now are back on the march and trying to gain more political relevance. And sometimes they've come into conflict with Christian groups in the area. So it is rather important to understand where their lines are being drawn and the areas they inhabit. Well, I've been writing for a very long time about Shia militia groups. And often it will give you some access to different leadership elements that are within those organizations because you know, they want to see good press for themselves too. But often this develops into different, more personalized relationships where I can ask questions, they can ask questions of me, uh, and sometimes you can acquire different sorts of information that way. So the sources I used for this project uh, often uh, will come from different interviews that I've given to uh, Shia militia leadership, to other members. Uh, other times I'll use social media, uh, and social media has been a great source for different locations for uh, various groups across the region. And other times I'll use open source news reports. It's important to develop a good primary source network because primary sources, you're really getting to the meat of the issue. And with secondary sources, often there's misinformation, Sometimes there's incorrect claims that are there. Other times there's just blatant propaganda. And it always depends on what source you're going to and, and how you're using it. In terms of news reports, uh, I've used uh, reporting that's come in Farsi, in Arabic, and in English. I don't speak Farsi, so I get some help with that. Um, but I do try to analyze any, anything across the spectrum that will give me more information. For over 10 years, I've been focusing on uh, looking at social media to kind of suss out different details about different organizations. Now, there was a time when this type of information wasn't taken as seriously. It was a little too new. And sometimes there's a generational split that does 
pop into this, but I think researchers and a lot of analysts now are fully appreciating the types of information they can glean from different sources that they can find on social media. During my research, I've actually found that some of the most honest reports of where certain groups are located or what they're doing come from their social media pages. And often that's because many of them are decentralized. And they'll actually have their own uh, marketing plan that's going on right for that group right at that time. And you'll get all sorts of different pieces of, of data that will come up at you. When it comes to tracking the different Shia militias, I tried to put the logo of the actual organization down for wherever the event had occurred. If it's a meeting between, say, Kitab Hezbollah and another organization, or if Butter organization had deployed somewhere in the, uh, in the area around Mosul, I would try to put an icon there that's easily clickable and so that when you open it up, often there's a picture that goes along with it and a story so it can help develop our understanding of what exactly is going on. When we look at these points on the map, I also tried to cover deaths that were taken by these organizations. For instance, one of the groups actually lost a member, his name was Ali al-Jurani, uh, and he was killed on June 12th, 2018. I had just talked to him around two weeks before he was deployed, and I figured that it would be an interesting addition to put him down on the map and kind of understand his story as a militia fighter who is now at the Iraq-Syrian border who was fighting the Islamic State and then died doing that. Many of these groups are openly hate the United States, have killed hundreds of Americans in the past, uh, and often continue to threaten us. Uh, they really don't want us in the region. Uh, there are also other groups that are slightly more friendly. But getting a better picture of the armed forces on the ground is something you need. The reason this work is important, what I hope it sheds light on, is how the focus on these little details make up a bigger picture. And I think for policymakers, researchers, analysts, and sometimes just plain old observers who are interested in the Middle East, it really does set the record straight and also provides a little insight into the interesting comings and goings uh, on in the region.